Thank you, Jason. Um, so thank you for joining us and welcome to this P2N Network webinar um, brought to you on behalf of the Dual Credit Think Tank. Um, as you probably noticed from our blog and our recent announcement and newsletter, we wanted to go ahead and provide this informational webinar specifically on the Higher Learning Commission's recent proposed policy changes to their assumed practices. Um, so to get us started real quick, I wanted to go ahead and just let you know what we're going to be looking to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just do a quick overview of the current assumed practices, specifically uh, highlighting those that are uh, specific to dual credit as it relates to the accreditation of faculty. And so, as you may already know, these assumed practices are not just in spe uh, specifically designated to the process of reviewing and accrediting high school instructors. They actually are inclusive of all faculty who teach in the higher learning uh, for the higher learning commission for the respective institutions. So, um, but given the context of the webinar, obviously we're going to be talking about it in the sense of the partnerships and dual of dual credit in the state of Illinois. Uh, we're also going to be doing uh, a quick overview and highlighting some of the recent amendments to the Dual Credit Quality Act, uh, along with system rules associated with the Illinois Community College Board. Um, and then lastly, we're going to go ahead and specifically call out um, some of these policy changes that have been proposed um, to be able to give you an opportunity uh, to not only view them alongside us, but hopefully maybe ask a few general questions uh, along the way. I did want to say, though, that it, this, as I mentioned, is information only. The P2A network at the current time does not have any position in this. Uh, we simply just wanted to share this information with you, given that the call for feedback is part of the informal process the HLC has initiated, moving into its formal um, process of the first and second reading uh, in, the, uh, in the coming months. So with that being said, I do want to go ahead and introduce myself along with my co-presenter. So my name is Rodrigo Lopez. I am the director of P20 Initiatives for the Center for P20 Engagement at Northern Illinois University. And joining me here today is uh, Ms. Amy Galvin. Amy? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Galvin. I am the Government Affairs Director with Stanford Children, Illinois. Um, I, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of folks on this line, but for those who are not familiar with STAND, um, we are a nonprofit organization that works to advance educational equity and youth justice. Um, our policy work cuts across four different areas, adequate and equitable funding, early literacy, youth justice, and high school success. And dual credit falls firmly within that high school success bucket. And so our work in the dual credit space is what brings me here today um, as we partnered with a lot of um, organizations around the state and districts to um, grow dual credit enrollments um, and uh, it basically create good good policy, strong policy that supports districts as they, as they build those programs up. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Um, <clears throat> and I would also like to encourage everyone to go ahead and just take a quick minute to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and with that, um, as I said, because it's information, I'm sure many of you might be hearing this uh, uh, about this for the first time or have some knowledge about the HLC proposed policy changes. And so I encourage you to also ask questions, drop in comments for others to respond to uh, as we go through some of this information um, in today's webinar. Before I start to talk about HLC, though, I do want to go ahead and highlight uh, some just general information about the P2A network. I do see that the list of participants, uh, many of you are part of the network, so thank you for joining us. Um, but some of you may not be familiar with our work, and so I do want to encourage you to visit our website. I do want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Um, Jason, who is the Senior Director of Learning Partnerships uh, with the P2A network, as well as the College of Education, NIU, uh, helps co-lead the uh, p Network, and so he's going to drop in the link in the chat uh, that is going to take you not only to our website, but also to subscribe to the newsletter. Um, but as, as you can see, uh, we are representative and inclusive of educators and organizations uh, as early as early childhood to post-secondary education and training. So we look forward to you becoming part of the network if you're not already um, a part of, of our work. And then with that being said, specific to the P20 network and our work, um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, the dual credit think tank is um, leading this webinar and thinking behind it. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts about who we are and what we do, but it is a group of practitioners, both on the secondary and post-secondary, 
um, who came together about a few years ago to discuss both opportunities and challenges policy related, but specifically with practice as it relates to the policy has been coming through in Illinois um, to enhance uh, opportunities for students in dual credit. So diving straight into the Higher Learning Commission assumed practices as they currently stand, uh, the HLC is one of six regional accreditors in the U.S. Um, and so Illinois is part of the HLC and it is also um, along with 18 other states. And so specifically calling this out, as you can see, uh, the assumed practices um, are best understood as a matter of fact. It is what institutions use to set policy and procedures at the institutional level. And typically what we found out is that these assumed practices may be reviewed uh, annually. And so last time this was reviewed was about a year ago. In thinking about the assumed practices today, what we're going to be talking about is the teaching and learning, um, where the um, language and uh, guidance specifically as to how institutions go about uh, reviewing and approving qualified faculty comes from. So specifically calling this section out, you can see from the various languages I just mentioned that these institutions rely on various uh, language from the HLC to set direction and policy at its institution. A few things that I want to call out specifically, though, is that um, as it currently stands, I've bolded some uh, relevant and important language, which you'll see later on has been part of some of the sections that are being proposed, uh, changes that are being proposed for. In specific, um, academic uh, institutions, HLC members specifically, are looking not only at academic credentials, but maybe looking to look at setting minimum thresholds for other types of experiences as part of that evaluation process. As you can see in the third bullet point, that is something that they oftentimes refer to as equivalent experience. And so one thing that I wanted to go ahead and share with you is that that link, which we'll also share in the chat, is to a document the HLC put out um, several years ago to help institutions um, to help to guide institutions through the process of creating their institutional procedures uh, as to how to go about qual uh, determining qualified faculty. A couple bullet points that I that I jotted down on this slide comes directly from this document. The document is several pages long, um, and it includes a lot of uh, important information uh, and relevant information for those who are looking to get. Um, better inform about how institutions go about determining the different uh, factors used when de uh, uh, determining if a faculty is qualified. Specifically, though, I know one conversation that we've had not only through the dual credit think tank, but I know the uh, state of Illinois has also been very focused on is the potential use uh, by institutions of using tested experience as a substitute or in addition to supplementing academic credentials. One thing that I do want to call out as you're reading through that, though, is that um, as it currently stands, one of the uh, pieces of uh, critical um, information in this document talks about how teaching itself, uh, that is teaching experience, years of teaching experience, uh, cannot be exclusively used to uh, qualify a faculty member. So that was just a very high level, just overview of the current assumed practices. But before we go to looking at the HLC policy changes that are being proposed, we did want to go ahead and do an overview and, and highlight a few components of Illinois Dual Credits policies uh, specifically with the Dual Credit Quality Act and the ICCB system rules. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so most, as, as I'm sure many of you know, um, the statute for governing how, how Illinois uh, has a dual credit program is the Dual Credit Quality Act. Um, that was recently amended. It, I think it was a, originally launched in about 2016. This has been amended in 2019. 
Um, and then again in the last year, which is going into effect as of January 1st this year. So um, the part, the overall act um, is a really big piece of legislation that essentially, again, set up, set up all the rules for how dual credit programs work, which is um, that, that colleges have um, content or have uh, control over quality and content. Uh, there's minimum teaching or qualifications to teach, uh, determines what a stu student will be eligible, um, how many courses they could take, you know, where the courses are taught, how much they cost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the more recent iterations of the, or inter you know, amendments to the law was the model partnership agreement, um, which is, uh, could be used as a default agreement to essentially say, you know, and, and it outlines similar roles that this is what the secondary partner does, this is what the post-secondary partner does. Um, and I think that there's a link there so you can read all of that statute there. Um, the newer piece um, extended professional development plans, among other things, but I think we'll get into those. So as you guys may know, professional development plans um, was the state's fix for expanding dual credit programs while having an ongoing teacher shortage. Um, the original PDP plan set up um, some basic requirements for teachers to, to you know, enter in an agreement with their secondary and post-secondary partner to say, I will go and get these course requirements. In the meantime, I can teach this dual credit course while I'm finishing up and pursuing um, my the necessary credentials. In most instances, um, that's typically a couple um, a couple courses that they'll graduate courses that they would need to, to round out those credentials. Um, the more recent, oh, I'll stop, is the, the I'm sorry, I think the next slide actually gives the detail on PDP plans, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so so the um, so the most recent amendments um, did essentially three things. Uh, first, it uh, extended the PDP plans, so those were intended to sunset. Um, obviously, our teacher shortage has not uh, been solved, so uh, this this was uh, an extension of the program so that folks would have another three years um, to uh, not to continue the on current uh, PDP plans, but that there was a more another three years of opportunity to enter into PDP plans. Um, it also added a CTE instructor um, pathway, so um, allowing uh, folks to be interimly qualified to teach a CTE dual credit course while they become fully qualified. That was a new addition. Um, and then it added a notification um, for pet faculty so that they would essentially know that this was happening so that they were in the loop at the secondary side that there was that their college and institution was entering into a partnership with a high school for dual credit. And then the newest piece was it added uh, mixed enrollment, which would allow a classroom to have mixed enrollment, um, high school and uh, college credit students in the same classrooms with differential instruction. Um, how that how that instruction looks and plays out is is um, something that's decided within the partnership, and um, the this post secondary institution obviously still maintains control over quality. Um, and again, that was a that was a fix for the teacher shortage that we've heard a lot of districts that they needed just additional flexibilities that we've got, you know, some kids that are ready for this, some kids that are. Um, and there's some data collection around there so that we can see how that program is working um, uh, as it as it rolls out. So. Did you want to take this one? Frederick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Um... I think in alignment with the Dual Credit Quality Act, and as many as many of you know, working in the community college sector, <clears throat> ICCB through their systems rules manual also, also provide guidance to community colleges in working with dual credit uh, programs and setting their dual credit partnerships. And so just to kind of a bulleted list of items that are included in these rules, um, uh, rules manual, uh, as you can see, um, very much aligned with what Amy was just talking about in relation to the Dual Credit Quality Act. But uh, we wanted to reference it though here because it is another component that is um, <clears throat> used in reference uh, when setting programmatic policies and procedures to help guide the direction of dual credit programs in various uh, regions. And so again, um, at the top of the list is also a language that's inclusive of how to go about qualifying instructors to teach dual credit courses, um, which just in general, it is very much the same as it relates to both the Dual Credit Quality Act and some of the language that is currently found in HLC with the, with the minimum thresholds. And so I'm going to turn it back to Amy, though, because most recently, as you know, because of the amendments um, that have gone into effect, uh, there is currently an open comment period to changes to these rules. That 
um, so yes, there is, and I can throw that link in the chat too. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, as Rodrigo was saying, ICCB has has um, kind of their implementation rules here. Um, they're asking for open comment period through the 19th. Um, you'll see it's pages seven through 13 of the document itself um, has, and then it's like blue highlighted and underlined with changes are. Um, right now, the rule, uh, the, the proposed rules are really straightforward. It follows the letter of the statute. Um, it's the call for comments is making sure that the A, that, that, that folks understand what those rules are and that B, um, they will that the policy that the statute will be implemented with fidelity, essentially, and that those rules do uh, match with the intent of the law. And so, or you know, if you need, if, you know, if, if districts need greater clarity in a piece, or you know, how does this plug in, or how does this relate to these other pieces, this would be the time to submit those comments. Um, and you can submit them by sending um, an email to Matt Barry. There, he's the ICCB. Um, uh, policy director um and like i said those are due on the 19th which is a sunday so no <laughs> but essentially they're set up 45 days from when this was posted and that was back in september so um yeah perfect thank you amy okay so um again it was just kind of real quick overview uh letting you know what the current assumed practices are also giving you a little bit of information about the dual credit quality act the iccb rules along with these proposed changes to the rules um and so i do know that we have questions in the chat so i think we're just going to go ahead and wait and uh, answer as many of those as we can um after this section here uh, specifically going to go ahead and call out the language um most of it verbatim that has uh, was put out by HLC to HLC members. Um, and so for context, um, the document, if you had the chance to see it and review it uh, with the added language or the strike through language, uh, was asking HLC members to be able to reflect on that and provide uh, feedback, uh, requesting really kind of information or comments as to what would be helpful for them when receiving guidance on these three items, the equivalent experience, significant progress towards degree, and the periodic evaluation of faculty. Now, this initial feedback is due by next week on February 15th. Um, but as I mentioned, um, and this is something that they call out in their communication, uh, this is a part of an informal process, and we do anticipate that additional opportunities for HLC members uh, will, for, will be forthcoming um, as part of their official process through the first and second reading of these proposed changes. But I just wanted to kind of put it here uh, front and center so you can kind of think about um, <clears throat> these changes as they, as they, as they pertain to these different uh, specific items. A couple of things that I wanted to go ahead and call out specifically from their communication, as you can see, is that um, this is work that the HOC has been engaged with specific to dual credit for some time now. Um, as we know, based on the most recent set of amendments to dual credit quality act going back to 2019, um, there was a lot of conversations around the PDTP plans, which I know we have a question about, um, specifically looking to figure out how uh, institutions could be looking to um, be in compliance with these assumed practices, but at the same time, be responsive to the, the Illinois legislation. Um, I will go ahead and just kind of call out one specific item, though, in their in um, in their communication, which is that part of these proposed changes that they've drafted uh, has been in close collaboration with two um, uh, important agencies, organizations, I should say, um, at the uh, one at the regional level and one at the national level, uh, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, as well as the National Associ Association of Concurrent Enrollment Partnership uh, Programs, also known as NASEP, uh, to which ILICEP is the state chapter. Um, with that being said, this communication um, was specifically um, noted the challenges that they have become um, knowledgeable about as it pertain to the accreditation of instructors to be looking to, to who want to teach dual credit. And so, again, coming back to the assumed practices as a whole, the assumed pra practices do pertain to all institutions for all faculty. But the proposed changes here, as they mentioned in their communication, uh, are specifically highlighting the need to be able to go ahead and bring further equity 
as to how schools and partnerships can go about uh, qualifying faculty to teach. So in other words, kind of one of the main things that they're looking to do, um, again, verbatim, is that one of the major goals is to eliminate any restrictive impact that the current HLC requirements have on student access. Um, and that is specifically to be able to increase the number of students who may become from underserved backgrounds or rural areas. So if you recall, uh, some of this language was actually uh, provided in one of some of the first slides um, as they currently are written. Um, and so what I've done for you here is I've literally copied and pasted these proposed changes. And so the strike through um, is language that is being proposed to be removed from the particular um, <clears throat> set of policy. And the bolded language would be added language. The highlighted text is really just kind of for, for us for here because I, I wanted to make sure that I specifically called out that section because as we were just referencing both the language from the amendment to the Dual Credit Quality Act, but also ICCB Rules Manual, um, this is, I believe, uh, one of the most important here for the state of Illinois. As you're reading it, I think one of the specific things that I do want to call out from this highlighted section is this area where it starts with significant progress towards credentials, equivalent experience, or some combination thereof. And again, I think there was a question about PDP plans, um, but Amy, I'm not sure if you wanted to maybe go ahead and um, add some context to that. Sure. Um, so regarding the, I'm going to throw in the chat. So ISBE had some guidance that came out around um, the most recent changes to the Dual Credit Quality Act, and they did a really nice job of showing, A, the PDP pathways and, and defining mixed enrollment in there. Um, and so I, I, th this particular policy change would, again, some things that we've heard with PDP plans is that HLC is, is, does not find this as incompliant. And so this our reading of this is that this essentially would um, it makes space for CDC for PDP plans with that line um, significant project progress towards credentials. Um, we would read that as as a as a nod towards understanding that PDPs are in place and are acceptable to HLC. Um, should I get I can I can keep going into more detail. But I think that answer. no, I think we're probably going to have an opportunity to maybe dive into some of that uh, history as well. Um, so. Uh, the next set that we pulled out from this communication, as you can see, um, it's really, I think, uh, twofold. Um, one, this language here that's bolded, oops, sorry about that, um, specifically is calling out the high school dual credit instructors progressing towards the achieve achievement of those credentials. So again, thinking about the PDP plans as it's written in the Illinois Dual Credit Quality Act, um, but another comment I think that we have have heard uh, in the field for many years is how some institutions um, have been able to go through the process of accrediting, um, not accrediting, I'm sorry, approving qualified faculty uh, with credentials that may be similar to those of teaching assistants. And so this language here included in the parentheses uh, in, as part of the first sentence um, is also indicative, I think, of some of the items that Amy was ref referencing um, with the legislation and, and some of the progress being made. The other thing I think I wanted to go ahead and call out specifically with these two sets of uh, changes that are being proposed is, um, and we'll get to it more in depth here soon, is that uh, if you recall, the tested experience um, language is currently in the assumed practices um, is not really, uh, is not new, right? So uh, what they're including here as part of the tested experience is, um, clarity, as they state in their communication, is further language to uh, inform institutions of the opportunities that they may be able to implement to review a candidate's credentials beyond the academics, uh, beyond teaching or supplementing of the teaching experiences. The section that's highlighted here at the bottom with the strike through is just a call out to just note that 
it is not being removed. It was just changed to a different section of the assumed practices within the within the B section of the policy. And you'll see here soon in the next slide. The other item we wanted to call specifically from these changes that have been proposed is that at the bottom with the bolded language is once again, you're looking uh, at added language that will help clarify um, two institutions that used of the, allowing an instructor's current progress to be counted towards the um, a credentialing of their status as a dual credit instructor or as an adjunct as a faculty of that institution. So again, I think coming back to this, uh, one of the things we wanted to go ahead and specifically uh, reference is that the HLC has started the process to be able to better understand what type of guidance moving forward, if these proposed changes were to be accepted by the board, would help institutions better understand how to go about setting procedures and policy at the institution level that will help them dictate um, and measure equivalent experience or that significant progress towards degree. Um, the third item there, um, although very important, I think uh, it does not necessarily relate to some of the progress and work that uh, dual credit partnerships are looking for in, um, in, in their partnerships. Again, I think one of the things we will, do wanna call out is that if you are an HLC member, um, or if you know uh, if you're an uh, HLC member, uh, is to encourage them to look into this communication, to look into, uh, to look into this process, um, to consider providing feedback uh, to the HLC before the deadline, um, but definitely looking for additional information that may be forthcoming as part of their formal process and to engage with them um, specifically to the these proposed changes. One of the items that we found um, on their site is that um, relatively soon here, I imagine within the next several weeks, um, these formal uh, the formal process will begin with the first reading um, typically in February or, like I said, probably within the, the weeks leading into March, um, and then with the second reading in, in June. Um, so in terms of a timeline or a formal process of that timeline, we don't have one yet, but we will definitely be looking to share that out um, if we are able to uh, get a hold of that. Um, that way, I think going back to the work of the dual credit think tank, but other other practitioners and other organizations have been very active in this in this space. Uh, I know this is uh, of high importance for many of us, and so we would definitely like to get that information out to as many people as possible. Um, so with that being said, I do want to pause here, kind of use this screen to just kind of look at some of the questions we may have gotten, uh, received um, as we were uh, talking about some of the information on the slides, um, but also just kind of reference that in addition to the links that were dropped in the chat, um, you have access to the slide deck uh, and you have access to these links that I'll provide you not only with additional information about dual credit, um, but you know we obviously would love for you to share this with others uh, to help them become knowledgeable about this or just to continue conversations and thinking about how to um, join this work. I'm I'm ready to uh, jump in with questions for both of you from the chat that I've got organized here. If the two of you are ready, um, I'd like to preface this though by saying to everybody on the call, just as a reminder, we are obviously not HLC, and and actually from rules making type of work, and HLC is a little bit different than. The ICCB call out, for example, where it's an actual governmental agency, um, the types of clarifications you are asking for here, um, while I am very interested in Amy's and Rodrigo's answers to your questions, these are exactly the kinds of things that you should be providing as comments. So I, I just want to stress that a question can be the best actually form of a comment 
uh, in response to rulemaking and will require uh, the rulemakers to sharpen their pencils a little bit. And it actually helps them out too. They may think they've been clear about that and, and haven't been clear. Um, and so, so these, are, these are really great questions that can become your feedback regardless of the answers that Rodrigo and Amy are about to give you. So um, I'm gonna mostly go in order. Joanne, when I skip your first question, don't worry, I'm gonna bundle them back to back. So I, I will get back to both of them. So first, um, we had a question from Terry and you ended up talking a little bit about it uh, when you talked about the, uh, uh, the Higher Education Compact, the Midwest Higher Education Compact and NASEP. But Terry's question was, Specifically, how will these align to the NASEP requirements? So to the degree to which you can speak of that, and again, I will give a call out as I hand it off to them. We do have, we have multiple ILSEP members here uh, today and much of the, the board is actually here and ILSEP is our state chapter of NASEP and we'll throw the link to ILSEP in the chat here in just a moment while the question gets answered. So go for it. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, so. I think what I'll say to that, um, just kind of from pre previous experience working for a community college that was undergoing the um, process for accreditation with NASEP. Um, for those that are familiar with NASEP, they have various standards, one of them being um, on faculty and part of the um, standard is the review of credentials and approving of credentials. And so uh, from what I can recall, well, looking at it specifically right now is that there is it, it asks for alignment it's just looking for uh, uh alignment between the institution's processes procedures as to how they go about uh hiring other faculty uh whether it be full-time or adjunct um so there isn't necessarily anything different that i believe these proposed changes would be looking to do um that would uh, contradict or add to what NASEP would be uh, requiring those institutions who are currently accredited or looking to attain accreditation um, by them. Um, Amy, I'm not sure if, if you have anything else to add or if you are familiar with NASEP's accreditation. No, I, I that that was all that was all you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. But um, as Jason said, I think I would just add that you know. Um, we do know that uh, a few uh, LSEP members, or um, whether on the board or just as, as part of the, the community at large, um, are accredited by NASEP. So that definitely would be something that we would love for them to maybe look into as they're potentially looking to provide feedback to HLC as it relates to that, to NASEP accreditation and standards with faculty. Sounds great. Thank you. The next question is, is certainly one we uh, have often heard from, from school districts. And so this came from Dan. Our college told us as something similar, I should say, maybe not this exact, but questions along this line. But Dan's question was, our college told us that they can't allow us to have a teacher on a professional development plan, a PDP, because HLC will not accept that when the college is under review. So can we now continue to have teachers on PDPs and have them begin teaching dual credit courses if they have more, more than 18 hours completed in a master's degree program. <clears throat> Amy, do you want to start with that and then maybe I'll just add to it? Yeah, so I think the question that that is actually kind of cutting to the heart of this issue, um, which is, you know, the state had introduced PDPs several years ago. Um, and again, as, a, as, a, as a, a way to address the teacher shortage, and a lot of colleges said, wait a minute, this is putting us out of compliance with HLC, and our accreditation status is being threatened. And then, you know, the conversation kind of bed, it was, you know, which is, which is correct, state law or HLC's accreditation, and there, there is no right answer there. there. It's a very, very gray area. We see, and we at Stanford Children, obviously, we 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 believe in professional development plans. It's something that we've pursued. And so we read these these um this rule proposed rule change as a positive thing for PDP plans, that it's that the HLC is saying, look, we heard you. We recognize that this is causing confusion in the field. This seems to be something that other states are pursuing. How, this is this is their way to alleviate that 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 conversation and, and that pressure that they that if these rules as proposed are accepted, 
that, that would be exactly what that would mean is that you could continue to use PDP plans or use PDP plans and without fear of, of HLC saying you're not in compliance. Um, but again, that, that, that's what the call, comments are asking for is that, is this something that you are using? Is this something that you, um, that is helpful to your institution? Um, that that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add is I know that just kind of working through the dual credit think tank and other members of that community um, or within other organizations is that we we have heard of uh, some of those um, just practical challenges as to how to go about um, looking into the the potential benefits of a PDTP plan, but the process behind and the communication actually back to the state agencies who are, I think, most recently has been clarified, we'll be looking to track that the the actual approval of a PDP plan, but also the progress of the completion of that PDP plan. Um, is that correct, Amy? Okay, thank you. Sounds great. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next questions. So this one, again, a perfect question for um, for a response to the rules. Uh, please clarify mixed classrooms. What does that mean? Uh, does that mean uh, those meeting the college prerequisite for the course with those who do not meet the college prerequisite for the course? Currently, and this was from Joanne, uh, mixed classrooms means everyone meets the course prerequisite, but some elect not to take the course for dual credit. It's a great question. Um, so it's actually the former. So um, the addition of that language, the Dual Credit Quality Act, uh, now allows for partnerships to uh, include students who would not have or do not meet the minimum competencies or prerequisites of that course to participate in the course. Uh, they would be enrolling in the course only for high school credit. Um, going into the course, they would become um, knowledgeable of that fact and kind of help through that process. Um, and so they would have the benefit of uh, taking the course, but they would not be able to, if successfully completing the class um, at the end of the semester or at the end of the academic year, however it's offered, uh, would not have the benefit of receiving the college credit along with it. Um, but they would be in, in the class, taking the class with those students who uh, would be enrolled um, both on the college side and the high school side. And if they successfully complete the course, would be receiving both the high school and college credit at the same time. Um, I think to your comment about currently there are practices in which uh, students may be participating in a dual credit class, having met all the minimum competencies or prerequisites, but elect not to enroll for college credit um, for various reasons, um, you know, in their own personal academic um, plan. I'll just add that we, there is differential instruction, and that is still left up to, um, again, the partnership and the post-secondary partner to decide what that would look like. Yeah, that's a great point, Amy. Um, thank you for bringing that, bringing that up. Yeah, so in, um, I think currently as it's practice in those cases, uh, there are have been some partnerships who currently have um, implement in differential instruction. Um, but I do believe that the, the language actually is specified in the bill that introduced uh, part of the bill that introduces about allowing for the uh, electing to um, bring in differential instruction, uh, rather than kind of just leaving it open to the partnership to, to, to kind of negotiate or consider. Mm -hmm. And I've got another question from Joanne. And again, I, I do just want to reiterate that while listening to Rodrigo and Amy's answers, their answers are exceedingly clear and easy to follow. Um, this doesn't mean these will be HLC's answers. And so mm -hmm. please do not hesitate to uh, repose these same questions as comments directly to HLC. If you're a school district, um, you want to partner with your post-secondary institution to do that, uh, by all means, we would encourage encourage that feedback. That's the purpose of today. So with that said, another clarification question uh, from Joanne. Can you provide clarity on what actively collaborating means under quote or otherwise actively collaborating with a higher education faculty member, unquote? And I will just add, this is a perfect example because I know in my head what I want this to mean. Mm -hmm. And this is what I would choose to act on in a school district or community college role. But without knowing from HLC, yes, we might find out a few years later that they don't agree with my working definition of it. And 
And so clarity will help. Um, so Rodrigo, Amy, your answers to that one. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point, Jason, I think, for calling that out and just kind of prefacing um, what I'm about to say as well, because I think uh, so kind of speaking not to the inclusion of this language and this proposed policy changes, but just from practice, um, I think many co community colleges would uh, would agree that in working with schools, um, there is um, <clears throat> Um, kind of onboarding in continuous professional development or learning opportunities for collaboration between high school instructors and faculty. And so some of that is just procedural in nature, like orientation, training, uh, reviewing of course syllabi, um, professional development in the content area. And so again, uh, from just knowing how, how this is practiced, uh, that's what they may be referring to. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if that is what that entails, or it would be inclusive of other res requirements um, that would allow for an, uh, a, a faculty member uh, or a high school instructor's credentials specifically to be reviewed and considered based on, on what they're um, looking to, to, to add to those changes. So, uh, Amy, I'm not sure if maybe you have a different interpretation of that. Just that that's somewhere that I would, that would be my, you know, crux of my comment is, a, you know, how do you define this term exactly, you know, if, if, and going through, I think that's, as Jason said, like going through this document and being like, I don't know what this means, like I would interpret it this way, but somebody else would say it this way, like that's exactly how you could come at these comments and say, you know, this, I, you know, I, this isn't, this isn't detailed enough for us, or, you know, this would be my, you know, choice of how we would do it, but you know, whatever. So yeah, that's, that's, you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do want to jump in and putting on my, my like political science hat here, what Amy just said, if you heard what Amy just said of, oh, Amy also has that question. The one thing I would ask is if you have this question, don't rely on just Amy to put that question forward, for example. The more people, this is like when we have a technology issue, the more people who call the help desk with that same issue, the, the more likely that issue is to rise to the top of the pile and the more likely that issue is to have depth put into the work around it to clarify it. So um, again, this is something where while we know uh, there isn't a lot of time left. There's only just over a week to go here. If there if there is an opportunity to formally or informally pull people together regionally and talk about it, and if you have agreement, um, you, you know, submitting that um, or having multiple regions submit that can can be a benefit to helping HLC help everybody be as clear as possible with this effort. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Uh, we do not at this time. And uh, I did a couple minutes ago ask if there are any other questions right. to drop them in the chat. So, um, yeah. No problem. Well, I think, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we're going to hang out here for a few more minutes. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll give you about 15 minutes back if you need it uh, before your next meeting or your next phone call. Um, but on the screen, again, uh, just links to our P20 network site. Uh, we do have a uh, presence in social media. Um, and of course, if you're not yet registered for the newsletter, please consider joining and subscribing. Um, we will continue to uh, share any information we, we receive or find out regarding this HLC proposed policy changes, but along with other uh, initiatives and efforts to um, continue to work on increasing access um, for dual credit students in the state of Illinois. Um, the last thing I'll say, though, with that in mind, is that the dual credit think tank um, has um, placed this as its top priority, identified as its top priority. Uh, within the many different challenges and opportunities um, that we all are very familiar with. Um, and so one of the items that we will continue to work um, outside of these HLC proposed policy changes is um, looking to convene practitioners um, to develop or share out practices and procedures that are currently in place um, that may be uh, positively influencing 
the direction that they want to go with with their programming, uh, specifically as it pertains to uh, identifying high school instructors and getting them approved to teach dual credit courses in the state of Illinois. So just look out for that information. Um, as I said, many of us haven't worked in the field or currently working in the field uh, have experience. And so really, we're looking to go ahead and um, share out as much as possible for others who may be getting started uh, or who have very specific questions about a particular situation that they are looking to, uh, to resolve. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to staying in touch with you.